If the grid went down, how long do you think you could sustain out here? Me personally, probably indefinitely. This is so cool. It's like a spaceship. People's first thought is all the stuff they're going to have to give up. What I want to focus in is all the stuff you're going to get. <laughs> Fennel really good for digestion, and yarrow is good for wounds, and skinacea everybody knows about. This was a very fun project. The biggest machine that's ever been on this land would be a chainsaw. Where do you think, as a society, where things are heading? I was very naive when I started. It's wanting a better life, but it's also being worried that the life you have back in the city not going to work forever. <laughs> Joe, how long have you been out here for? 50 years. So 50 years ago, you purchased this land? I purchased this land, 2.8 acres. It cost me $800. <laughs> Last good deal. <laughs> Nobody was moving into Yancey County at that point. It was the second poorest county in the state. There was land for sale everywhere, or, or you could just have, you know, empty houses. Hey, you mind if I live in there? Sure, you can just mow the lawn once in a while, you know, that kind of situation. Not anymore. Now Yancey County has very much been discovered, all kinds of people flocking. Because in. we're, we're what, an hour north of Asheville, is that why? Yeah, it's within range of Asheville, and anything within range of Asheville is booming. Little towns that were almost abandoned, like Marshall over here. The main street was all boarded up. Now the main street is buzzing. So how did the locals take you when you first moved out here? Uh, by and large, they're very tolerant. It's kind of a mountain thing to be pretty tolerant of your neighbors. And I was during the Vietnam War, and there were some people who looked askance at long-haired people, as there are today, I suppose. But, but by and large, people are pretty tolerant. It's like live and let live kind of attitude. Right. For many, many years, I'd say my annual income was, it was well under $10,000. I've always been below poverty line. I don't worry about taxes at all. You grow all your own food, or a lot of it? No, a lot of it. We've got land for it, we just don't have the people. So you're looking for people to come out here? Absolutely, yeah. Just yeah. to help like, stay here for a little bit of time, or be here permanently? Both. Eventually, somebody's gonna have to take this place over. I'm 80 years old and my health is not great. So I'm thinking like about an eight-person, eco-village, small community situation. This is a project to create what I call a paradise garden, uh, which is uh, various definitions for, but one of them is a botanical garden of useful plants grown ecologically and arranged ornamentally, meaning a beautiful garden uh, where all the plants are pretty much growing by themselves, and I can become sort of a hunter-gatherer okay. in my own garden. I just okay. have to remember where they are and when to sure get them and so on when i started i'd been reading a lot of anthropology At that time in the 60s there was all this information coming out about hunter gatherers and a lot of interest in uh, just uh, how we got ourselves into the situation we're in vis-a-vis -vis the planet uh, where we find ourselves like being the most destructive <laughs> organism ever and a lot of the thinking was along the lines of it all went wrong with the beginning of agriculture. A lot of people think that's when all of a sudden we went from living as part of Gaia to wanting to manipulate. So the thinking is, well, of course we couldn't live like that anymore because there's too many people. Right, right. So my response to that is to up the carrying capacity of my land. I want my land to be able to support more people. So how do I do that? I pack it with more and more useful species. Okay. How do I do that? Well, A is figure out where they are, and like the obvious place is East Asia, so mm -hmm. they have a very similar bioclimate and so on. So okay. if you want more plants, more diversity of plants, then you want more diversity of habitats. For instance, there's no standing water on my land. The water comes down from above in the national forest, and then it sinks into the ground. And these are some of the, well, the biggest peak in the Appalachian yeah. Range is Mount Mitchell, right up yeah, there, right? Right up there. So right beyond these trees. Yeah, we're at the foot of the Black Mountains, and I'm the last place on the road adjoining the National Forest. I grew up in Detroit. My family moved is what got me to North Carolina. My dad was a professor, and he, he went to the Library of Congress for a while and decided he'd rather teach, so he came down to North Carolina. 
And so I came along with the family because free tuition. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then after that, I went off in the Peace Corps and lived with tribal people in Borneo for about three years and suffered significant culture shock when I came back home. Right. <laughs> the culture shock was not going over there. The culture shock was coming back and seeing this, this glut of stuff that we have. Mm-hmm. Just walking into a mall, I'm like, <laughs> you know. Um, I spent several years thinking about going back to graduate school and studying anthropology and going back overseas and working with these people. And eventually I decided I just didn't, I didn't really want to study because I was so impressed with their lifestyle. I mean, here's people, you're coming out of Detroit where, you know, you don't really do anything except have a job, make money and fulfill all your needs with your money. Here's people that build their own houses, grow their own food. They're pretty much self-reliant. Uh, all the communication is by river, uh, little canoes along the river. They're, they're really not going anywhere much. Uh, so that was amazing. And then they had, you know, all their rituals and their costumes and just such a rich life that they had. But eventually I decided I didn't really want to study it. I just wanted to live it myself. <laughs> so like, because they were both, they were all uh, healthier and happier than people in America with so little making so little demand on the earth. I was back in Detroit and my next door neighbors was a little kind of hippie commune Mm -hmm. of craftspeople and they were, they got a line on some land right here in this valley. Okay. They were interested because a famous craft school is not very far from here called Penland School of Crafts. So I came down with them and like most hippie communes, it lasted a couple of years and then kind of imploded. Uh, Sorry to interrupt, why, did, why do you think they implode? Why, don't just, they, why do they work well in Borneo, but maybe not here? Uh, I don't know, maybe because we're all such individualists. <laughs> okay. You know, would be one speculation. Sure. Um, but you know, that's what we need to create. That's the next frontier. Like I made this paradise garden out of a couple of acres of land that was too rocky and steep. It had never been farmed. Nobody would look at it. Now phase two is to have a community to take it over and run it. This is my kind of signature herb, Mm -hmm. which I think I introduced to America actually, but I promote it as the best plant to grow for your health. Gynostema pentaphyllum, Chinese name Jiaogalan, it's a vine, it's actually in the squash family, but it has identical compounds to ginseng. And ginseng is very much under threat of overharvesting. Wild ginseng out of the woods is worth $1,000 a pound some years. Oh, wow. This stuff is practically a weed, but it has identical compounds to ginseng, so I... What does it do for your health? Hmm? What does it do for your it's health? It's what's called an adaptogen which means it's uh, they're health promoting. They're not really sickness curing, they're health promoting. And they boost your immune system. This whole concept of adaptogens was actually developed by the Russians who wanted to win more gold medals at the Olympics. So they put a lot of research into their adaptogen uh, because they don't have much ginseng. They have something called Siberian ginseng, Mm -hmm. which is one of which is right over here somewhere. So do you use all of these plants in your daily life? That one I drink every day. So one of the ways that was discovered, it was a folk herb. It was not one of the traditional Chinese herbs that's been used for thousands of years. Chinese government started keeping good enough statistics to realize that certain parts of China had an extraordinarily large number of centenarians, people living to be 100 years old. Like there's way more of them in this part of China. So they went down to investigate and they're all drinking this stuff and calling it immortality tea. So that's kind of when it came to uh, more global notice. It's huge now all over East Asia. It's coming to America. They call it sweet tea vine. It's showing up in tea shops, mm-hmm. but it's, it's not as big as it's gonna be. <laughs> goji berries, whoever heard of goji berries 20 years ago? Nobody, it's a famous Chinese blood tonic. Now they're everywhere. Shazandra is another one that's coming on. One by one, they come to America. But if you go to your average doctor, mm-hmm. they're the, going to give you some The drug. AMA is not very fond of herbs. Okay. 
for various reasons, including historical, because in the last century there was a huge rivalry between the herbal people, who are called eclectics, and they had their own medical schools and their own journals, and they were very active. They're the ones that brought all the American Indian herbs into uh, Western practice. But there was a huge rivalry between them and the AMA, the medical establishment, which the medical establishment finally won for various reasons. If you're a conspiracy theorist, you could say, well, it's because at a certain point in time, all the wealthy people, Carnegie and Rockefeller and Ford, pumped all this money into Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and nobody gave any money to the herbal people. Uh, Do you agree with that theory? Yeah, that, that, that happened for sure. Okay. I mean, whether you want to call it a conspiracy or not depends on <laughs> how open you are to conspiracy ideas, but it certainly happened, there's no question about it. Uh, and so for more than 50 years, people came out of medical school having been indoctrinated with the idea that herbs was a myth. They didn't really do anything. It was just folklore. If they did anything, it was just placebo effect and okay. so on. And that went on for a long time. The AMA denied that ginseng did anything right up until about the 60s okay. when the Russian researchers... Uh, who actually coined the term adaptogen, invented this rat swimming test, which is the first thing that proved that ginseng actually did something. So you can throw the rat in the water and time how long it can swim, and then you give it some adaptogens and it'll swim twice as long, and, and that's incontrovertible evidence. So they finally had to turn around and go, well, actually, I guess it does something. So then they had to figure out what it did and that's kind of where the whole immune system was discovered, was by finding out how these adaptogens work. That's my Just in the 60s? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a very recent discovery yeah. in that, in, for the yeah. West. Yeah. It's your tool zone, obviously. Tool wall, yeah. Inspired by Chinese gardens, they divided their gardens up a lot with little walls into little micro areas. This is like a homage to Chinese gardens. It's mostly clay and straw. And this is all your power, huh? Yeah. So that gives you everything you need, pretty much, power-wise. Yeah, well, we have another set of panels out further out. We have okay. like two different sets of panels. This is it, and these will end up, of course, on the roof of the new building. You can see they're already getting into the shade. It's not an ideal location. Yeah. Well, it's got to be tough down here because it seems like you pretty much have a small window of light. Especially yeah. in the winter, I'm sure. Yeah, we don't see a lot of sky. We've never gotten too much into astronomy because we have a very small piece of sky. So here's a chunk of Paradise Garden. Uh, probably at least 100 useful plants in here, edible, medicinal, and so on. Those big, giant yellow ones are mullein. Excellent for uh, coughs. Okay. Yeah. Fennel, really good for digestion, and yarrow is good for wounds and so on. Echinacea, everybody knows about. So what are you doing? Are you selling these off your property? Because you're, you're not consuming all of this, right? No. You and your team? We sell seeds and plants. Okay. And then in the past, we have made lots of preparations, particularly tinctures, but we'd also have made salves and pills and liniments and... Many, many different things. I also taught herbal preparations for a while at a school in Asheville called uh, Taoist Traditions. The goji berry. Yeah. I thought that was a tropical berry. No, no, no. no it grows all the way up into North Dakota. It's become weedy in certain parts of uh, America. So what does somebody do, Joe, if they don't have your setup? You know, all of this sounds amazing. Everyone wants to be healthier. Uh, it's tough, though, if you're in a busy life. Like, how do you apply this to your life if you don't grow at all or you just buy supplements? Well, you could do that, yeah, if you're, if you're interested. That's how I started. I, like I said, I picked up this book sort of randomly called Chinese Tonic Herbs, read about them, sounded great, so I just ordered some Okay. to start trying them. And I'm like, yes, I want to grow this in my garden. So then that sent me on a long search to botanical because most of them were not available in America. Okay. Uh, looking for trading partners and seed savers exchange and corresponding with botanical gardens in Korea and okay. Japan. And that, that just led me uh, 
Nice thing if you're not trying to make money in your life, which I'm not. I'm, I'm, one of my goals is to earn as little money as possible without like feeling like I'm suffering or something. You know, I'm not really denying myself anything. I got a little wasabi plant. It took me like 10 years to develop that as a sort of a crop. Uh, I never would have had the time or energy to put into that if I had a nine to five job. I never could have done any of this if I had a nine to five job. So how do you make your money, if you don't mind me asking? We sell seeds, we sell tinctures, we sell plants. Okay. Currently, a lot of my income comes from doing plant walks, educational stuff. Okay. Teaching. Okay. So all I'll leave that link at the bottom of the video. Are you mm -hmm. trying to sell more seeds or, or no? Or? Sure. We used to sell a lot of tinctures. The herb shop burned down. Okay. So we now got a little sort of temporary shack down here where we're starting to make tinctures again. That was a... It was not a spectacular source of income, but it was pretty steady. So Any time I'd walk by, there'd be a, this is just a glass jar. It's all self-service. Okay. There'd be 20 or 30 bucks in there, you know. Right. Every time I walked by. So typically in the past, I had six to eight apprentices. I always had more applications than I had housing. Okay. Now, for the first time, I got more housing than I have applicants. We get a certain amount of what are called woofers, you know that term? Yeah, yeah, woofers, yeah, I know that organization. just comes for a week or so. Sure. But, but what we really want is people that are going to come for the whole summer. And, okay. And eventually, I need to find people that want to just move here for the rest of their lives. You want them to live on your property? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And well, I'm sure there's someone out income there. Income by taking over one or another aspect. You know, somebody could make a nice income just from the medicinal herbs. Somebody could make a nice income from developing herbal products. Somebody could make a nice income from the teaching, website development. And then the big income possibility is this herb school, which I was starting to set up at the end of the road. I got a half acre up there at the very end of the road, last bit of national forest the trailhead for the steepest hiking trail in eastern north america is right there on my property mm -hmm. and i was going to start a herb slash permaculture slash eco ecology school and that could provide enough income for the whole gang of people here this is where i live up there when did you build that about 35 years ago I've been here 50 years, but that house is about 35 years old. So everything we're walking by has uses. Wild yam, and this lily is used in Chinese medicine. And the Apios americana is an edible endangered species. Wild lettuce has been used as an opium substitute, but it's really not very good. Are you still learning? Oh, yeah. In, in this world? Oh, it's endless. Okay, it's endless. Absolutely endless. Okay. Yeah. Arrowhead, a nice wild edible. It's a, it's a water plant. As I said, I don't have water on this land, so I buy these kiddie pools when they get cheap at midsummer, <laughs> and the stores want to clear them out. What is this up here, Joe? This octagon? That is a oh. yurt. Okay. Uh, that's the newest building on the property, and over there on the other side of the deck was the oldest building on the property. Okay, way over also there. A yurt. So this is where the people that come to help live? Yep. Yeah, I've got five or six little uh, shelters, and I have ambitions to build more, particularly out at the end of the road where I want this herb school to be. The idea is to have like 10 or a dozen little very simple shelters for people who come for a week or a couple weeks, you know. So is this more of you want to pass your knowledge on to those interested, or you feel like the world needs more of this movement and you want it to really blossom out? Well, it's both. People need to live differently. The way we're living on Earth is destroying the planet. I, I think we all recognize that. Uh, it's just like uh, in terms of changing to a more successful way of life, how far are you willing to go? You know, when I talk about this stuff, people's first thought is all the stuff they're going to have to give up. Whereas what I want to focus in is all this stuff you're going to get, <laughs> all the positive stuff. You know this concept of uh, forest bathing? No. You heard of that one? Very, very big in the Far East. In Japan, they got a word for falling dead at your desk. They can say that in one word. Uh, people are just so overworked. So, so people are being prescribed 
to do this thing called forest bathing, where you just go out in the woods and kind of meditate and open your senses, your ears, your nose, your eyes, mm -hmm. and just absorb this natural energy. Well, you can put a helmet on somebody and measure their brain waves. And it's just a difference of night and day between somebody walking down a city street and something be walking down a mountain path. And that's all very, very measurable. So the idea is to transfer my needs from civilization, which is my word for, what do you call it, the state or the economy or just like the way everything works with money being the, the blood of it, back to fulfilling my needs from a direct relationship with the planet, with Gaia. Okay, so you built this by yourself or with anyone? With friends. There were uh, half a dozen people, sometimes more than that, on work days. The upstairs is clogged up with books. I've, I've gotten a lot of donations, more than I have places to put them. Taoism, you love La Lao Tzu? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a whole bookcase of Taoism. Now I'm down to just one shelf. <laughs> are these some of the supplements you take every day? Yeah, these are tinctures I've made for various purposes. There are a lot more of them uh, down in the little herb shop. That's a feng shui compass. <laughs> How does a feng shui compass work? Oh, it is incredibly complicated. Each one of these little circles will give you a piece of information. There's about 32. It's a very interesting concept. The Chinese are now working on scientifically validating it. Mm -hmm. But it's been thought to be nonsense, you know, but it's very important to them. And you, you don't build a new building in China without consulting a feng shui expert about the location of it and which direction the doors should open and like, is this a favorable spot? Originally, it was mostly uh, for locating tombs. It's thought to be very, very important where you bury your ancestors. Like okay. that's gonna affect all of their descendants okay. forever. So, yeah, so you so, do all, all your cooking here? Yeah. Well, we, eat, we, we do a lot of cooking over there. I eat okay. with the group typically. Okay. Great. They cook on wood over there. Over here, I'm unfortunately stuck with propane, but. Have you spent much time in China? No, just a couple of months. I mean, just about a month. The Chinese government invited me over for a conference on uh, medicinal herbs. So it was great. I mean, I've been wanting to get to China my whole life, but I could never really afford it. Yeah, so just books coming in, donated books. Okay. With boxes of them upstairs that have never even been unpacked. This entire thing is about Chinese garden design. Something that's very interesting to me, philosophy of Chinese garden. Wow, so if, if someone is interested in this field, coming to you is, is like going to Harvard, you know. Uh, you're not you're not the higher education institution I'm saying, but you're you're the knowledge that took a lifetime to accumulate. On some of these topics, yeah. So the reason Chinese gardens are so interesting to me is they were built for self improvement. Like the idea is to create an area with perfect energy, because what you do in a Chinese garden is you practice Tai Chi, you do meditation, you write poetry, you do landscape painting, you play your zither. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all like for spiritual development. So the, the purpose of the garden is to have optimum chi energy because we derive our chi from the environment. Like I like English landscape gardens, they're very nice, but the Chinese have this extra dimension that is really a garden that's good for you, okay. you know, which is what I want my garden to, to be. It stayed balanced between the Taoists who said we should live according to nature and the Confucians who said we should live according to society. So the Confucians are the ones that want to kind of manipulate everything. The Taoists, uh, but, but most of all the, uh, and China has like made many, 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 many important worldwide discoveries, printing, paper making, gunpowder, the compass, this is all from China but they didn't use it to colonize the rest of the world. Uh, those are all discoveries because the Taoists were really interested in understanding the planet in order to fit better. 
not in order to change it around. They just wanted to fit in better. That was their goal. Yeah. So what's, explain again the, the equivalent of that in Western society. You're saying in Greece? Oh yeah, well there were schools of thought that thought we should live according to nature. And we now call them cynics and skeptics and Epicurus was another one. Uh, but then all that's left is fragments. There's not very much left of all the things they wrote, Heraclitus and so on. A lot of it's very Taoist. Uh, what about the argument that, yeah, this way, let's just say away from technology, modern world, more off the land, more in tune with nature, isn't scalable for the average person, i.e., you're in an apartment tower that holds a thousand people. You're really taking up very little space to have that existence. You're all sharing one roof. You're not taking up land. So in a way, because society, we have a fixed amount of people on the earth right now at this very time, if everyone was spread out, then there'd, well, be, I, no, there'd be no nature in a sense, right? I looked into it at one point and they, uh, uh, it might have changed by now because this was about 40 years ago. But the amount of land per person was it was doable. In, in fact, in, I Ameri fit, in America, it's doable. No, this was worldwide. The amount of arable land mm. uh, per capita, and and it breaks down into the, like there's arable land which you can cultivate, and then there's sort of agricultural land would be more like pasture and so on, and then there's wasteland. And you can figure out uh, you can divide the number of people on Earth into the number of acres of that stuff. And everybody gets, you know, about an acre of arable land and another couple of acres of this kind of number two land. But I'm not, I'm not, I, I look. But my I, whole project is wasteland. Wasteland. This land okay. would not be class, classified as good for anything. Okay. So that's part of because the it's experiment. Because it's too here. hilly. A hilly, I mean, it was 80% rocks. <laughs> okay. This was a very fun project. This is when it originally was built. This is the original building. It was okay. all, almost all the material came off the land. Uh, I'm well endowed with poplar trees, and I got plenty of rocks, and I got clay to make cob out of. <clears throat> so it was just me and a couple of guys. Uh, the biggest machine that's ever been on this land would be a chainsaw. Everything is just hand labor. If you were young, let's say 30 years old right now, is there any way you'd do it differently, arranging this lifestyle? Oh, I would have to rethink the whole thing, given what I know now about the uh, ecosystems and so on. I mean, I would still need to make a clearing because just for diversity of habitats, you know. Okay. Uh, I can't do everything in the woods, but part of the reason why I'm interested in medicinal herbs is because a lot of them grow in the woods. And I didn't want to cut down all my trees. So there's this whole concept of non-timber forest products, which is mostly used in the tropics to try and get people to not cut down all the forests. Yeah. But it's equally valid here. I was very naive when I started. I never studied botany in school or ecology or any of that stuff. You learned all of this as you went along? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What would you... What would your advice, you've lived a lot of life, you have a lot of wisdom, what would your advice be for a young person? Right Get now? a hold of a little piece of land. <laughs> and just start. And go from there, yeah. Yeah, we used to have a really nice little uh, cob dome. It was built at a cost of $50. It was like a kiva. Got bent in saplings and then put clay. Uh, it was beautiful. A tree fell on it and didn't really bust it down, but it kind of hurt it enough that water started to get in. So about 10 years later, there was a lot of rot. We had to knock it down. But it was, it was wonderful. So that's like a house you could whack together for 50 bucks, you know. And you're off and running. You, know, you don't need much more than a pointed stick, really. I mean, you don't need a big bankroll. I started off here, my bankroll was, I think, $500 total that I got from a season of apple picking. And we bought a bunch of tools and we bought 50 pounds of brown rice, you know, packed it all into a little Volkswagen and here we were. The whole thing we need to do is live according to Gaia.
That explains all the problems we're having on Earth is because we, we no longer have a valid niche. You know, we, once upon a time when we were hunter-gatherers, etc., we had a valid niche. We fitted into the whole system, and then we went off on our own. But maybe the, the system was very communal. Like your trip, I'm sorry, what was the island you went to? Borneo. Borneo. It's very communal, so that system works really well. Tribal. We're, we're in a very, yeah, tribal system. We're in a very individualistically driven culture. Has its pros, has its cons. One of the cons is how do you create these systems where there's community doing all of their part and working together? Well, like what holds it together? That's a challenge. Because there they have survival maybe to hold them together or some well, sort of spirits or kinship, gods. Tribal kinship. society, yeah. So what do we have holding us together? I mean, religion's <clears throat> always been. The staple for that sort of thing. There's a book I'm reading at the moment. He's okay, got, is the answer in here? He's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he's got a, a positive definition of the primitive. I, I see the, a huge dichotomy between what I call civilization and the primitive. The primitive being life in Gaia, civilization being life in society based on money. Uh, yeah, they have uh, primitive societies are based on kinship, basically, tribal societies. That's what holds them together. So you can always tap out here in a way. We're in a modern society. If you need help, you can go off this plot of land and, and some, someone or something's gonna help you. Like even if you had an accident, you'll go to the ER room, mm -hmm. right? So yep, maybe yep. there's that knowing there's something there outside of oh, that. Oh, for sure. The that's tribe. what makes, yeah, that's what gives us the freedom to do this kind of thing. Uh, whether or not that's going to be available in 50 years. <laughs> where do you think, and obviously nobody has a clue, as a society where things are heading? Oh, I, I think we've got a very, very difficult future coming up, just merely with climate change. You know, the larger parts of the country are going to become very difficult to inhabit. If we think we've got an immigration crisis now, just wait. <laughs> Wait until, you know, everything below 30 degree latitude becomes uninhabitable. What are we going to do then, you know? Politically, you know, the one way people are reacting is to become more right wing. They, they want somebody in authority to sort it all out for them. It's impossible for the government to fix the problems that are coming along because the problems are caused by the government. But like, an argument would be the right wing would say, the left wing is author authoritarian and wants to, they want everyone to figure things out for them. Yeah, I know. So each side says the same thing. It's sure. interesting, right? Yeah. yeah, there's this guy around here. He's still talking about Al Gore. He thinks Al Gore was trying to take over the country with his myth about global warming. Is, well, Al, is Al Gore still flying private though? I don't even know if he's still alive. <laughs> I think he is. So this is, uh, I've never done anything with this land very much. Introduced a few interesting plants, but it's mostly in its natural state. These are, these are foreign. They're not native here, right? No, no, they're totally native. Wow. Appalachia has, uh, when you get down more Southern Appalachia, there's much more variety with the plant life. Yes. Uh, very big for the variety because you've got uh, the northern flora meeting the southern flora. Right at this spot. Yeah, pretty much right in here. So this is, Mount Mitchell is the farthest south of like paper birch, for okay. example, and a number of other things. Whereas it's also the farthest north for certain other things. Uh, so yeah, we've got an unusually high level of diversity here. Very fortunate. If the grid went down, let's just say supply chains grinded to a halt, the grid goes down, how long do you think you could sustain out here right now with what you have? Uh, well, me personally, probably indefinitely. If I had six or eight people here, that might start to get more challenging. There's just any amount of stuff out there to eat, but that many people would probably exhaust it pretty fast. So we're gonna have to get on the stick about boosting our food production. Yeah, so this is one of the shelters that oh, we this have. This is so for... cool. It's like a spaceship. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly my thinking. Yeah, It's hard to explain, but these, these walls, 
come in, mm -hmm. and then it's you're based just on looking a Mongolian down. dwelling, which was actually nomadic. Yep, called a yurt, but this is a wooden version designed by a man named Bill Copperthwaite, who lived way up in Maine, very remotely. He was off the grid more than me. Okay, had to walk into his place for about twenty minutes. Are there a lot of people doing this? I think so. I have no idea how many. I think they're scattered all over the place. Yeah, and you wouldn't know. The more remote they are, the I less mean, it was they're a very big back-to-land movement back in the late 60s, early 70s. Most of them gave it up and went back home because their parents kept nagging them to grow up and get a job. You know? But not all of them. So you have these lingering pockets here and there. Silo, just down the road, is the oldest intentional community in America. All this intentional community yeah, in America. A mile and a half down the road. That's partly why I'm here. Silo mm. Community Incorporated. It was started before World War II. Had a lot of uh, draft avoider types. It was started by a man named Arthur Morgan, first head of the TVA. He was the first head of Antioch College, if you ever heard of that. Sure. It's quite an experimental outfit. A lot of uh, Quaker influence. They have like 1,600 acres. They got like 50 families. It's a intentional community. They, uh, but uh, not like Twin Oaks. I mean, they don't all work on a business together. Everybody's got their own. They're driving career. off the community to work or something like that. Maybe they could drive off the community to go to work. Oh sure. I mean, there's carpenters. Okay. A lot of them are craftspeople. There's doctors. So they just want to be with a group of like-minded people. Yeah. I think there's going to be more of that, to be honest. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's the next big challenge is for us to relearn how to live in community, because you know our, our emphasis on money and so on to fill all our needs means we don't really need each other. It's so crappy that it's, it would be pointless to try and fix it up. So we're just using it until we can get something rebuilt up above. Okay. It has a dirt floor. I mean, what do you, you know, it's like a joke, really. But we do the best we can. So these are all Chinese herbs. So these you're purchasing? Uh, or yeah. these, okay, yeah. they don't come from here. Most of them grow in my garden. Oh, they come from your not, garden? No, they have not in, uh, what's in my garden is not enough quantity okay. to do this. If we harvest stuff from my garden, we'll typically tincture it. Okay. These are tinctures in process. It's sort of like a canning process, or what is that? It's preserving with alcohol, extracting and preserving with alcohol. So how long do you do this for? About a month. Then we squeeze them out and put them in bottles. Oh. And, and you're, you're boosting so, stuff, antiviral stuff, good for the brain, good for sleep, good for anxiety, good for broken so bones. So you're, you're selling this here? Mm hmm So people have to come here to get it's it, It's self-service. Right? People come in, get what they want, leave some money. Oh, great. So if someone's in North Carolina, they just got to walk up here, come into this building. Mm-hmm. Uh, take whatever, leave a donation. $15 for a two ounce bottle. Okay. Uh, is the asking price. I've thought about just not having a price and like pay what you think, but a lot of people are happier if you tell them how much to pay. They don't want to have to think about that, you know. This is beautiful in here, Joe. This is like a whole nother zone. Uh -huh. In an old cabin? Yeah, that's what I built out of the trees that were growing here in the middle. And I used uh, more of them to build the building that burned down. That was the first thing I ever built. I had a Foxfire book and it told how a traditional Appalachian cabin was built. I personally am just very drawn to mountains. And mountains are very big in Chinese thinking too, philosophy and and medicine as well. The, if the herb is good for something, it's twice as good if it came out of the mountains. Okay. Because there's more of this chi energy in the mountains. I know if he's home. Jeff, are you here? Oh, 
Okay, so one of your workers lives here. Yep. Oh, this is so cool. Uh, there's two houses like this that also have a sleeping loft. And then there's two yurts. And then there's various uh, places where we built a roof, but we haven't gotten around to walls and doors yet. Okay. The whole idea of this future community is it's gonna be some gardeners and some builders and some organizers, some people that can do computer, website, you know, outreach, kind of just a variety of folks. This is Ryan, he's been coming for several years. He's terrific help. And Kate, this is Kate's second year. She has okay. a lot of gardening experience. She's great. Rich is just showing up today for the first time. You just out came with in. Splitting wood and nice. This was half of my life work right here. The other half being the garden. <laughs> so the half that was right here was my lifetime library, and it was an exceedingly good library. The whole back wall was booked. There was a book. It was full of books. And then the back end was my uh, apothecary. There was a whole wall of tinctures of both Chinese and native plants and another partial wall of dried Chinese herbs and maybe a hundred different species. There was a cabinet which had my seed bank, some of them quite rare. The fire even was so intense it affected the greenhouse over here. That also burned up. How did it start? It started by accident by a foolish person who made a fire in this very fire pit on the deck, which has been done thousands of times, but he neglected to put it out when he went to bed. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. That's all it took. Right. At five in the morning, it was fully inflamed. When they woke me up, I ran downstairs, grabbed a fire extinguisher, looked outside and dropped the fire <laughs> Forget it, the whole building was in flames. Right. Running up, you know, 50 feet high. This is where you cook your food? Uh, that's a pizza oven, periodically fired up for baking. This is meant to turn into a workspace at some point. You can see there's windows everywhere. There's just stuff everywhere. <laughs> kind of maddening. It's a lot to manage. The old yurt if you want. Oh, yeah. Oh, Doesn't another yurt. anybody in there at the moment. Yeah, so if you don't keep up on this, this is basically jungle. I mean, it's... Yeah. In two months, it's, it's taken over everything. There's no ghost towns in Appalachia. You go out west, you know, and there's buildings that are 100 years old. Uh, not around here. They just get grown over. <laughs> the mushrooms will eat it. This is the oldest building here, almost 50 years old. It's really on its last legs. There's a lot of rot. Okay. It's been neglected at different times. So just as an effort to get a few more years out of it, we covered the whole roof with plastic. So it can't really be repaired. Oh, this one looks nice. Oh, it's a very, it's one of my favorite spaces of all. There's something really nice about having a dwelling space without corners. Yeah. <laughs> everything you own is just like within your peripheral vision. Yeah. Also makes it easier to keep warm, for example. And this stays plenty warm in the winter with that one stove? It, uh, it doesn't hold heat. Okay. But it's very easy to heat up. Yeah. So you can come in there when it's 20 degrees and you can have it comfortable in 20 minutes. It's on its way out, you know. It used to have an openable skylight, which was very nice for ventilation. So this is kind of a last ditch effort to get a few more years out of it. I'm gonna feel very sad when it finally has to get knocked down, but it's inevitable. More and more of the people that are moving in are more middle class, it seems like. They just want to get out of the city. They don't necessarily have the kind of uh, idealistic goals that I have, have and had. They want to have some chickens and a vegetable garden, and it's great. The pandemic really did that, huh? I gather. I'm pretty sure that's where it's coming from. Possibly a certain amount of... Uh, I'm told that the phrase is doomsaying. <laughs> I, I had never heard that phrase until last weekend. But, you know, a certain amount of worry about the future. 
So it's, it's wanting a better life, but it's also being worried that the life you have back in the city or whatever is not going to work forever. <laughs> Anything else you want to say, Joe? Anything we missed? I'm sure there's probably a lot. But no, I think we did a pretty good job. Just want to refer people to my website for lots and lots more information. Okay. And you're looking for apprentices to come out here? Yep. To learn under you? Yep. To help out with all of this beautiful mm -hmm. nature and to learn? And hopefully people with some experience. Okay. Like I usually say you should have a, a year's of gardening experience okay. to think about becoming an apprentice. Now we do take on woofers very short term, you know, for a week or two at a time. Okay. Uh, when we have the space, I don't know, maybe as a result of this video, we're all of a sudden going to be overwhelmed. But long term is more ideal, right? Like, oh yeah. Like for the summer, full summer season, something mm -hmm. like that. And if you come back for the following, the longer people stay, the more helpful they can be. So yes. what, they, what they're getting for that is they're, they're going to get to live for free here, but the big takeaway is you're going to learn how to live in an environment like this, pretty much completely removed from someone who's done it for 50 years. Mm -hmm. All right. Educational opportunity. Room, board, and educational right. opportunity is, is okay. what we have to offer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Respect to how you're living and how you've lived. This is great. It's very, very cool to see. Good. All right. All Thanks right. for coming along, guys. Until the next one. Yeah, these are good echinaceas. These are the better echinaceas, actually. So when would you even do that? Fall? It would be a very big project. Fall or early spring, or when would you do that? You well, wouldn't do that now. No, yeah. probably not.